I've been helping a client recover after a kind of a nasty fishing event and some of the nastiness that occurred afterwards is we're trying to fix some of those problems and it came to me that uh, this is something we all need to talk about. Well, the problem that they are having is that somehow someone took over control of their Microsoft Exchange tenant. Now, that's something a lot of businesses use. I mean, a lot. I am not a Microsoft fan, that's for sure, but most of our clients use it as well. So we have to maintain it for them, keep it up to date, and configure stuff in it right now there's a whole lot of stuff to configure and it gets really kind of crazy there's no two ways about that one and what ended up happening of course is we had to come in after the fact and do a whole bunch of cleanup who did those emails go to that were being sent from their domain these phishing emails hopefully nobody fell for it and then you got to work on the legal side well what do we have to say and to whom and you know what's going on with all of this nastiness it's absolutely incredible the amount of work and i've talked about this before many times right it, it takes hundreds of hours to recover after certain types of hacks and costs a whole lot of money the bigger companies out there just the medium-sized ones it the current number that i've seen is about a three million dollar cost to try and recover from one of these types of hacks. Now, the good news here is there's no evidence anything was stolen. It was a target of opportunity, but it still is cleanup after cleanup after cleanup. Oh my gosh, such a pain. So I wanted to bring that up to everybody just so you remember a couple of things. One is you can never be 100% safe. And the really good news for us and our client is we had very good backups going back months, daily backups, which we have since changed to backing up about every four hours. So there is a whole lot that you need to make sure works when it comes to backups. I'm not going to talk about backups today, but you can find more about it on the website. I've certainly talked about it on the radio before. But the big thing I really want to talk about is patching because the problem most of us encounter is triggered by not having the latest software. You know, yeah, okay, there's zero day vulnerabilities. These are vulnerabilities that almost nobody knows about other than the bad guys. And there's nothing you're going to be able to do to protect yourself against some of those. Obviously, you can try and keep your network edge nice and clean. There's, there's a whole bunch of things you can do, but none of it is perfection, let me tell you. Very, very sure. So that's number one. Just like LifeLock says, right? They they can't guarantee that they're going to be able to see everything that might happen, which is absolutely true. I'm not a LifeLock subscriber, just so that you know. But it's that same sort of mentality. The other one is if your computer is subjected to some form of malware, some form of hacking, well, that's where making sure you have the right patches really comes into play. Because again, most of the time, the patches are going to fix things. But I, I want to point out that patches aren't just what you might get from Microsoft or Google or Apple. Patches have to be applied all over the place. Everything from your firewalls, your VPNs, to your computers, of course. But how about the light bulbs? How about the printers? Printers have been used to attack businesses before because guess what the computer is our, our printer is a computer no two ways about it because it has to do a whole bunch of work right it has to rasterize the image and control all of the mechanisms inside it's a computer and they can be used to launch attacks now the way most attacks work is they get into a network and then they try and move laterally within the network. In other words, they'll get onto one device, 
and they'll try and find other devices that might be vulnerable now that they have control over that one device inside the network, right? A very bad thing, at least for you if they are controlling your device in the network. So that's the IoT side. We, we've got to remember that all of our devices that are computers and that are networked are potential vectors for the bad guys to get in. So keep that in mind. Now, there are some ways to find out about patches. And again, I'm not just talking about patches from your operating system vendor. I'm talking about patches for all of the software on your computers, about all of your devices, your IoT and everything else. And there are some ways to find out about it. But, I, man, i got to tell you, they are very confusing. It's hard to find it all in one place. And then the big question is priorities. That's one thing I've really noticed the last couple of weeks again while doing this recovery. My gosh, it is all consuming. And the same thing can be true when it comes to patches. You, If you're looking at the active patch lists, the CVEs as they're called that come out, we're talking about multiple patches every day. And we're talking about thousands, tens of thousands of patches in a year. How can you possibly do all of that patching? You, you can't. How can you possibly keep track of which patches you really need to deploy because they are in the wild right now, the bad guys are using them, versus patches that, well, if you have any sort of a firewall, you're going to be safe. How do you do that? Well, I, I, I haven't found anything, and that's why I've been working on this whole patch aware thing so that you guys can sign up and get that type of information to help you prioritize what to patch, when to patch, why to patch, right? Put it all together. But at this point, try and find some mailing lists, email lists, subreddits, Facebook groups, whatever it might be. They're going to help you to know what you need to patch. And remember applications as well. As, again, it's not just your operating system. You're running a whole bunch of different pieces of software on there. And it's going to vary depending on what kind of a home user you are, maybe what kind of a business you are. But all of that software it should be getting patches because there's new vulnerabilities that are revealed, as I said, on a daily basis. So keep track of that. Windows Update is going to take care of your operating system. It might be taking care of your Microsoft applications. Still, almost every computer on your network will have third-party applications, things like PDF readers, media players, other business operation applications, things like accounting software, and on and on, right? So you got to stay on top of all of those patches. I know. I know. It's a lot of work, and that's, that's what I'm hoping I can... I can uh, take care of with the patch aware thing. You, drop me an email, me at craigpeterson.com. Let me know if you think that might be helpful to you. Maybe we can get you in on the alpha testing of this stuff. Uh, again, patchaware.com. Next one is if you can test before you deploy. In other words, that computer that you're about to patch, make sure you have a good backup of it. And ideally, it's running in what's called a virtual space. So you're using something like VMware, which I recommend over all of the alternatives in most cases. And VMware allows you to just take a snapshot and do upgrades and then test your applications together. So if you don't have that kind of a virtual environment and you do have applications that you depend on and you are worried that that upgrade might make your application not work anymore, well, do what you can to test it. Get Make your own little lab, if you will. Have a, a computer or two computers that talk to each other that can now test to make sure that any patches you're applying don't break things. That's a large reason why businesses don't patch. I've been into businesses lately that are still running Windows XP. Yeah, and they're doing that because they're afraid that their applications are going to break or more commonly, they don't want to upgrade the application. Sometimes the vendor of that software has gone out of business. Sometimes they don't have a version that's compatible at all and there's no longer an upgrade path. There, there's a lot of reasons why businesses don't do the upgrades, but man, 
you got to do them, you've got to test. So having a set of machines that you can use to deploy patches first, I think is a really good idea. Also maintenance windows, this came up in my business too here. One of our main file servers has been patched and patched right as time goes on and we need to reboot it because there were some kernel patches in other words down in the operating system so we have to schedule a maintenance window so remember that patching can require time but it can also take time and bandwidth to reboot the machines to maybe back out the patches if something breaks pretty badly that's again why I think you should take advantage of virtualization, virtualization technology if you can. But most companies are running their businesses more or less 24-7. Even if it's not a, an open door 24-7, there's still people working from home, right? So you got to warn everybody. And then what happens if there's a zero-day exploit or a real important patch? Well, then you got to schedule that. you got to make sure people know about it. Our friends over at Apple have been issuing these little teeny patches, very quick patches to close up some zero-day attacks that had been going on, and they got them out right away. You know, kudos to them, and you hardly notice that you're applying the patch, but most of the time it still requires a reboot because some of these things are pretty nasty. Patch management can really help you out. And above all, make sure you have some form of a rollback plan because patches can break things. Make sure there's a way to go back to the way things were before. All right. All of this you'll find in the newsletter, craigpeterson.com slash subscribe. It's even on the website, craigpeterson.com. We had a good article this week from Fox Business. Turns out that our friends over at ChatGPT, the creator OpenAI, is under investigation by the Federal Trade Commission, the FTC. We're going to talk about it. Well, the Federal Trade Commission's job, if you will, is supposedly to protect consumers, right? You could argue that some of the things they do are far less uh, protective of consumers and perhaps they might have been otherwise. But in this case, it's very interesting to read because we've talked about ChatGPT, right? There's these large language models, these AIs, uh, machine learning, all of that sort of stuff many times before. And the concerns that are popping up now are a little different, but uh, so much the same. And that is, there's, there's two sides to this. If information is taken, if it's stolen, and is then used by somebody else to make money, uh, is that legal? No. Obviously, it's not. So we now have some authors who are out there, some well-known authors who have put together a class action lawsuit. And some of them are actually suing individually saying, well, wait a minute now. Uh, what are you doing archiving all of our books? And there's a great lawsuit that was filed a few weeks back where the author had asked ChatGPT to summarize one of her books. And it did a very detailed summary. So obviously, ChatGPT had read her book, you know, read in air quotes there, her book. And obviously, there is a certain point where if it reads the book and it comments on the book, in normal law, for instance, if I read a book and I'm sitting here and I'm telling you about it and talking about it and we're conversing about it, that's perfectly legal under the fair use doctrine. In other words, yeah, she wrote a book. Uh, I'm talking about the book and that's going to help sell books, right? Well, how about if you are an author and your book is used in a context of, let's say, education? Uh, it might be uh, high school, it might be college, it might be something else. And all people have to do is uh, not even go and buy one of those little cheat books, but just ask ChatGPT about the book. How many people are going to buy the author's book at that point? 
and who owns what. I'm only aware of one court ruling that has really come out about this sort of thing. And the court at that point said, hey, uh, (laughs) guess what, guys? Anything produced by artificial intelligence is by definition uncopyrightable because it was produced by a machine. So something that comes out of ChatGPT can't be copyrighted. But what if, again, it's plagiarizing? Because remember, that's exactly how it works. That is precisely how large language models work. They are based on what it is that they have parsed and try and figure out a word at a time. So what's the next word? What's the next word? What's the next word, right? Does that make sense to you? So it cannot not plagiarize. Yeah, okay, it'll it'll mess some words around a little bit, but it's 100% based on other people's work. Uh, we, we should talk about that as well, because that's actually presenting some interesting problems for ChatGPT. Many people are saying it has gotten worse lately. So in an open letter sent to OpenAI that the Washington Post had reported on, and the Wall Street Journal was able to confirm, it said that the FTC informed OpenAI, the ChatGPT guys, that the company is probing or it is probing the company whether it has engaged in unfair or deceptive practices related to data security or relating to risks of harm to consumers. Now, part of the data security thing is anything it generates, it uses later on. And anything you put into it can also be used and has been used. So what we've seen now is proprietary business information being put into ChatGPT for ChatGPT to come up with a marketing plan, write a letter, help write a report for the uh, investors or whatever it might be. We've seen that information that was put into ChatGPT by companies and individuals now being leaked. So you could go and ask ChatGPT, tell me about the marketing that this such and such a company is in the process of doing, and it can tell you. Now, yeah, okay, some of the ChatGPT data sets are a couple of years out of date, but it's continually learning, quote unquote, as you're asking questions, as you're feeding it data. So in this 20-page document, the FTC is demanding that OpenAI describes in detail its processes for developing and training any large language models, as well as policies and procedures for assessing risk and safety before releasing new products. So what we have found is they did something very similar to Mark Zuckerberg in Facebook, right? For something that was very underhanded uh, and in some of the stuff alleged to be very, very illegal. Mark Zuckerberg decided what he would do in order to put together the Facebook is he he scanned uh, electronically here via the computer in the network the, uh, I think it was Harvard, right? The, The Harvard pages of the students who were there that's designed so you can contact another student if you're working on a project or you have a question whatever it might be and he took the pictures of the student each student and put them up online and basically it was uh so is this woman hot or not right with stolen pictures Right? It's incredible what happened. And then, of course, it grew and it grew and it's changed a whole lot since then. But, uh, and I'm, I'm simplifying it slightly as well. You might have seen, like, there, there was a movie about what had happened as well. So that's what he did. Well, guess what OpenAI is doing? Google, its whole business has been going online and scanning everything it can get its hands on. Right? If you go to Google and you search for something, what happens? Well, as a rule, it has searched all kinds of index, all kinds of web pages. It's prioritized the web pages. It's tried to figure out what you mean and what the most correct answer uh, answering web page would be. Let's put it that way and list the web pages with a slight summary. And the summary is usually skewed towards your question. 
So rather than just the first words on a web page, it's trying to help you understand, okay, this web page, here's, here's what it's talking about here. It's how it relates to what you want to do, right? Works, not bad. Now, if you go online, if you've signed up for Bard and if you're using your Google account, uh, in particular, if you're using the Chrome browser, what happens? Well, it comes up at the very top with a summary generated by Google Bard, which is the chat GPT, if you will, coming from Google. And so Google Bard is now creating an answer that does not any longer require you to go to any of the websites where it gleaned the information and processes that information in order to give you that really nice little wrapped up summary. See, see what's going on here? So who owns what? You know, it was bad enough when Google started putting little summaries up on pages. I remember the kind of the guffaw that came out of many people's mouths, guffaw, right? And I, I remember that very well because I was pretty upset too. Why should you not have to go to my web page if you want to see my information? Well, this is kind of interesting because we're seeing this now in steroids because people are using ChatGPT, people are losing their jobs to ChatGPT, and the whole thing is as unfair as Mark Zuckerberg and the foundation of the Facebook. We know jobs are just disappearing, and they've been disappearing since time memoriam, right? Certainly since 1900, when we saw the horse and buggy disappear and automobiles took over, right? We, we lost a whole lot of jobs back then. Well, if there's one thing to lose jobs for street sweepers who are going around after the horses and people that fed them and took care of them, etc., right? Uh, the stables, there's still a stable in New York City for some of these horses that give the tours of the park and all, right? It, it's it, it's kind of cool to think about, but look at how much better it's gotten from the days of the horse and buggy and today's day where we're driving cars around, burning gasoline or diesel, very efficient, efficiently getting places quickly, being able to stay cool, air conditioning. In fact, air conditioning has been blamed for a lot of societal problems down in New York City. You might ask, why, Craig, how, how could that be? Well, it used to be that it would get very hot in the summer, which it still does, of course, and that heat drove people out of those skyscrapers, you know, their five-story walk-up, to the park. And people used to sleep in the park, and whole families would be there, and they'd toss ball around, they'd read books, and they'd know their neighbors, Versus today, with air conditioning, everyone stays kind of locked up inside, air conditioning on, right? So we've seen a lot of changes. We, we don't now have people delivering big cubes of ice to keep our ice box cool, do we? Well, we are seeing some jobs here, according to Finance Buzz, that are absolutely going to be gone in the 2030s. So they've got a list of 15 jobs, and I'm sure you can think of some. Now, remember uh, 20 years ago when we were talking about AI, and we're talking about how things are going to change, and it's going to cause a lot of problems and some jobs and no problems and others, etc. Well, turns out that the number one job that they say is going to be extinct and this isn't a job specifically, but assembly line jobs. Just think of what we've done so far. Look at some of the plants, for instance, that have been built by Tesla that are almost completely automated. There's plants in China making cars, the same sort of thing. No people involved. Of course, unions haven't been happy about that. And there's a lot of people that argue that that's part of the problem with the U.S. auto industry. They just can't innovate because the unions force them not to, right? So blue-collar workers standing up against the bosses at the plant, well, AI doesn't care. Right. So a lot of traditional assembly line tasks that are involving repetitive manual labor, basic product assembly, 
that are already moving towards automation. Many of them are already automated, but it's going to move even more by these AI driven machines as they can look at a product that's sitting there and maybe something isn't quite right. It might be a little off center and used to require a human just to make sure that it was done properly. Well, now it can figure it out itself, right? So that's been going on for decades. Assembly line jobs gone, they say. Data analysts. Uh, this came up today too, but it's unlikely that the good old human data analyst jobs are going to be eradicated by AI, but they are going to be a lot different. And I'm not just talking about going to a language like R for those of you who are in that business. But AI can analyze large data sets and generate insights. I did that with my own articles. My wife Karen and I have been writing articles for a long time. In fact, we deleted over a thousand articles off of the CraigPeterson.com website because it was just getting so big and it was costing us a lot just to have it up online. And, you know, are you really interested in an article from 15, 20 years ago? Probably not. So we deleted about a thousand. And I think I've got two or three thousand articles left. I got to go through and uh, kind of whack them. But, anyways, I used some libraries that are out there and designed and put together a, a large language model, an AI, if you will, kind of like ChatGPT, and trained it on my articles. And I did it as kind of an exercise to see, you know, what would it be like? Is, is you know, is this hard to do? Is this easy to do? What kind of answers would I get? And I was actually fairly impressed, although it took two to two to four minutes to answer a question but it answered them just like I would because it had analyzed what I had written it's very good at that sort of thing so data analysts the careers are going to change humans are still going to play a critical role in defining objectives doing some of the result interpretation and providing some context but I gotta tell you I was impressed I did it myself right with my own articles bank tellers are already kind of on the way out according to the bureau of labor statistics they're saying that they're going to see a loss of about forty-three thousand bank tellers and we're already seeing that we're seeing that in a very big way where the bank tellers are being replaced by they're, they're kind of like an atm almost there's one at our local walmart and it's a different kind of ATM. It, I, I hadn't really seen these before. But it's almost like you're on a Zoom call with a teller located somewhere. You know, the teller could be at home. Who knows, right? And that teller can answer your questions, move stuff around. Of course, the machine itself can do all of that. And it can look at your face and do an ID based on your face. It's the, the need for in-person banking services has really dropped dramatically. I don't like part of that. You know, I, I was doing business, my, my first real business where I had large bank accounts and everything else was back in the 70s. And back then, or 80s, yeah, it was the 80s really. Uh, back then, you knew the bank manager, president, right? Every branch had a president and you knew the vice president and they knew you, and they would lend money based on you and who you are, right? They, what FICO score? And it was great. They treated me well. I treated them well. I had loyalty to them. And recently, we went into the bank and sat down with the branch manager and talked with her about, okay, here, we'd like to do an equity line and because we want to fix this and that in the house. And, and it, all, it went almost all the way through. And, and then the machine ultimately kicked it back. Everything was good. Credit rating was good. Everything was good. But it didn't like uh, the, the fact that I'm self-employed, right? Yes and no, right? Am I self-employed? Depends on the definition. But it didn't like that most of my income was coming from a, a business. It just couldn't understand that. So it, it, uh, it denied it. I, that's why I don't like it. And how about people who are going to be denied loans in the future? You want to buy a house. Well, where is the house? And we've had problems with redlining before where certain neighborhoods 
You couldn't get a loan. In some cases, it had to do with your race. They wouldn't lend you money if you weren't a, a, a white male, for instance. In fact, it, it was illegal at one point in certain parts of the country. So how are you going to make sure that those types of biases don't show up in these AIs that are going to be making some of these decisions? There, there's no way to. And particularly when you pile on top of this, that the people that design these AIs, that put them in place, can't even tell you how an AI reached a certain decision. They can certainly tell you, okay, well, you know, we do this and we do that. And basically, it, it's going back to the old calculus days in college, right, in statistics. Okay, fine. But how did it come to the conclusion that John Doe is guilty of this crime. How did it do that? They don't know. So we're facing that as well. Very, very scary, frankly. But other jobs, drivers, fast food workers, medical, medical diagnosticians, diagnosticians, and more are going to be lost. Stick around. Visit me online, craigpeterson.com. We got a couple articles this week about cars we're going to talk on right now. About your new car and its tracking ability. It's a gold mine. And we're going to talk about EVs. A couple more articles this week in the newsletter online, craigpeterson.com. Do you have an electric vehicle? Why did you buy that electric vehicle? Uh, there have been some studies out there over the years about these hybrids and electric vehicles and why people are buying them. I can tell you the reason why they're being manufactured. It's because of federal government requirements, these cafe standards that they put in place, where they are forcing companies to make electric cars. That is causing some problems. Right, like that's a surprise. So let's start with these new cars and how they're tracking you. Remember that the cars of tomorrow are going to be self-driving. There's no, no two ways about this. And tomorrow, not necessarily next week, next year. But they will be completely autonomous. How can they make an autonomous car? Well, they have to train it, don't they? How do you train things like large language models? How do you train things like cars? Well, you need a lot, a lot of data. You need to know precisely where the roads are. Well, you can find that by having people use your GPS. And the GPS is sending back signals telling the company exactly where you are on the road. So it now knows exactly where the road is. And then it needs to know also where are people driving, what kind of uh, routes, alternate routes could be taken, how can we avoid a traffic jam, what time are there usually traffic jams. Uh, it, it's a lot of data. And there's a great story on Wired.com that was in this week's newsletter that you can get for free at craigpeterson.com and Wired's talking about how modern cars are producing 25 gigabytes of data per hour. Amazing, isn't it? No joke. And this Wired analysis that was done that's in this story as well of the 10 most popular U.S. cars shows that they are all collecting a lot of data and they may know more about you than your friends and families do because it's not just that GPS data that they're collecting many of them have other sensors they might have LIDAR and that's certainly the case for some of these semi self-driving cars that are out there but it's just more and more data so what's interesting to me is there's a U.S. automotive firm called Privacy for Cars that's come out with a tool that they call the Vehicle Privacy Report. And this report kind of reveals how much information on your car can be sucked up 
by the manufacturers. So if you go to vehiclepricyreport.com and you enter in your 17-digit VIN, I think it's safe to do that. I, you know, It's easy enough to find VINs. You just walk around a parking lot and look in the windows, right, windshields. But you enter the VIN and then you can find out from this site here, again, it's vehiclepricyreport.com, what kind of data they are able to gather on you and you traveling. Now, some of it, of course, has to do with cameras that are looking at you from inside the car so that they can then look at you and say, oh, he's falling asleep, he's not paying attention, etc., and kind of wake you up and get you going again, right? They, that's not bad. But how about this other biometric information? Right, the cars can track where you're traveling to and from, but they can also record every time you touch that accelerator, how hard you're pushing it down, how hard you're braking, are your seat belts fastened? And then information about you. Some of these cards are locking and unlocking based on facial ID or sometimes fingerprints or even iris scans, right? That's coming down the road at us. And some of this data is being sold to the data broker industry and is then being resold to insurers, to the government, and to many others that are out there. Interesting, isn't it? So it's showing this, uh, again, vehiclepricyreport.com, how much information your car is gathering and how much might be used. So it, this is kind of like Apple has this privacy label for apps. Google has it for the Android. And it shows how Facebook might use your camera, how Uber might use your location data. This tool indicates that the vehicle manufacturers can can uh, suck up some of this information. So it's very interesting to kind of go through this. Wired ran 10 of the most popular cars. And there, let's see, results. Let me just scroll down here. You can read the whole article. Again, I got a link to it on my website and in this week's newsletter. Uh, so they used, let's see, Toyota, Honda, Ford, Chevy, Ram, Jeep, and ran them all through the tools. Uh, these results only apply, by the way, to the U.S. Different countries have different laws about privacy, and in fact, even different states here in the U.S. Uh, saying a lot of these cars have kind of the same thing, a lot of technical legal files. So let's start with Toyota. Camry, Tacoma, RAV4, and Highlander. Those are the ones that they picked and they looked at. And the privacy documentation that came from the vehicle privacy tool is the same for all of the 2022 models. Some older cars might collect less data. But they're going to collect, obviously, your personal information that they're using as a classifier. That's things like your name, your address, driver's license, number, the phone number, email, other information. You, you give it to the dealer when you're buying the car. And Toyota is no different than others. Uh, Toyota has a privacy document. This is just crazy. Uh, publicly available, 31,000 words. One key document is Toyota's Connected Services Privacy Notice, which details what can be collected. Uh, Toyota, some of them can scan your face for face recognition when you come in. Uh, it goes on and on. They got the Honda Civic and CRV, the Ford F-150. Uh, it's only one model that they checked, but it is in the recent list of the best sellers. Most popular across all categories and most of the time, right? Ford's got great products. Uh, you know, certainly the F-150, I owned one for quite a while to got into an accident. Not my fault. But they collect information about who owns it, names, location, details, driver's license, data. It's everybody, okay? I'm not going to bore you by going through all of these details. But it is a problem. No question about it. Now, let's talk about EVs because I got a couple articles on EVs this week and uh, another one on Amazon where Amazon had delivered something to a house and the house had one of these camera doorbells and it automatically when someone approaches the door 
issues a greeting. Yeah, no problem, right? Well, the Amazon driver apparently mistook the greeting, which was a nice greeting. It was the default greeting. And said that uh, this guy had, uh, I think it was a, a racial slur, okay? So uh, he, he reported it to his bosses at Amazon, and that very day, Amazon shut everything do down, right? Everything down. And this guy's house was completely driven by the Amazon technology, right? The Alexas and, and everything else. So he, he was out in the cold. <laughs> oh, man, what a pain. So remember that, too. If you're going to really automate your house, make sure you got a back way in, right? Back door, if you will. Have we reached peak virtue signaling with EVs. Remember what we talked about probably, what, 20 years ago? When did the Prius come out? And there was a survey that was done of Prius owners. And the survey found, number one answer, why people bought and drove Priuses was, number one, 70%. Because of what the purchaser of the Prius thought other people would think of them. Yeah, virtue signaling by far. And there are a lot of people that drive EVs for that very same reason. Of course, I keep repeating, don't think that they are green because they are not. And there's a great article I have this week that hits an angle I had never thought of before. And I don't know why I hadn't, but you know, I should have. And here's the bottom line. This is an article from townhall.com. And it's saying that electric cars are a scam. And the reason is that on average, your new electric car isn't even carbon neutral until it hits 70,000 miles. Now, when you break this down, what does a new car cost? Well, according to the statistics I saw most recently, $50,000 on average for a new car. Can most people afford the monthly payments on a $50,000 car? Heck no, right? I think that's pretty obvious. So uh, what do they do? Well, they lease the car. Well, these lease contracts have mileage allotments, right? And they're usually for, what, about three years? So if we say that you can put 30,000 miles on that car... And then you turn it in, which most people apparently, I don't know if it's most, a large number of people who bought EVs just turn them in and walk away from them, say, forget this, this is ridiculous. That car never reached carbon neutral status. You say, okay, great. So now it's at the dealer and someone else will buy it used. No, people are not buying used EVs because they're not dumb. Buying a used EV means you may have to replace a battery pack that may cost $20,000. It's going to cost you at least $12,000. Can't think of an exception offhand. Are you going to buy a used car that you immediately have to put, let's say, $15,000 into? No, of course you're not. Now, of course, that car might not need a new battery pack yet, but people are just not willing to take the risk, and I understand why. So, don't worry. Ford's EV losses are projected to hit about $5.1 billion in 2023. Yeah, when is this stupidity going to stop with the federal government mandating things that society, industry, etc. just aren't ready for. Let's take this slowly, people. Hey, sign up. Get the newsletter right now. CraigPeterson.com Every once in a while, I like to go and kind of recap things. And one of the things that has been incredibly popular is my tips. They're in my newsletter every week. So we're going to review a few of those top tips right now. I love that guy. Hopefully you do too. Well, I have been really diligent in my newsletters every week. And this is thanks to my wife. She's been kicking me in the pants for a while to do this, as well as you guys. Because 
Each and every one of us has questions about what we should do, how we should do them. I have questions. I go online trying to figure it out, right? We go and we look at Google or maybe we duck that go. There's lots of ways to do it. Nowadays, maybe you're going to uh, an AI of some sort over at Bing or maybe ChatGPT to try and get answers. Well, I have been putting together now for a few months a tip every week. And one week we talked about Patch Aware, which is a, a new service that we're going to be offering that uh, goes through, okay, here's what you need to patch, we need to patch it, how you can patch it, right? And I mean what you need to patch based on some machine learning, AI, and people skills looking at all of the patches, which ones you need to mess with. I have the top antivirus and anti-malware solutions for total PC protection. We're going to talk about that next. A step-by-step -step guide to clearing your browser history and wiping away your online footprint. Ransomware, the shocking truth about cyber criminals holding your data hostage. Protect your data like a pro the 32110 backup method, how to Fort Knox your files on Windows, a step-by-step -step guide. So those are some examples of some that were in my newsletter. And if you don't get the newsletter, make sure you take a couple of minutes here. That's all it'll take and sign up for because this is the free newsletter. You don't have to pay a dime. There's no big obligation. What I'm trying to do is get the information out there, get it to you, get it to your friends, let you share it with people. And once you've got all that information, you are going to be ever so much safer. Let me let me tell you, I, I'm absolutely convinced of that. And we keep hearing that from people. So that's a very good thing. And what I've been doing is putting these tips that I write, I put them all together from scratch, putting them up on my website at craigpeterson.com. So you can go there, you can get some of this information pretty easily now. And I do put it into my newsletter as well. So let's start with the first one that was in the recent newsletter. And this is the top antivirus and anti-malware solutions for your PCs. You know, the internet is a very scary place. It has some serious problems. Microsoft has been trying to deal with them for a very long time. And, I, you know, I'm a little opinionated here. And frankly, Microsoft has never been a particularly good computer programming company. And the worst part about Microsoft is how they started. And they started with a hack. It was based on MS-DOS, which of course Bill Gates bought from another company and sold to IBM, and that became PC-DOS. And they grew from there, right? They wanted a windowing interface. You might have noticed that Windows kind of follows the lead from Apple again and again and again. But they followed that lead and they put together their little Windows and Windows for work groups. You might remember Windows uh, 3.11 was kind of a big one for quite a while. And Windows 3.11 gave you that that little point and click interface, but it was still really DOS. It booted DOS and then put the little window interface on top of it. And because it was so poorly written and because the machines at the time were so slow, they ended up having applications that went around the operating system entirely and depended on that. So because Microsoft did not do what they should have done, what Apple had done, they gave people that were writing software, <coughs> they gave people who were writing software the opportunity to write things in a very inefficient or maybe more efficient, ineffective, less secure. There's a lot of ways to describe it, ways. So that's how Microsoft came about. And I worked on Windows for quite a while. One of the things, one of the projects I was on for a year or so was when Microsoft decided they needed to completely rewrite everything 
because it was such a mess. And that was Windows NT, the NT 1.0 days. And of course, that went along. And Dave Cutler, the design, you know, there's all kinds of history that we could talk about. But they came out with something that was better. But they still had so many programs that they had to run that were doing some bad things that, my gosh, uh, it, it just propagated all kinds of bad programming. Anyways, going into a lot of detail here, some people are going to like it, but oh, hopefully you, you appreciate the background, right? That's why you listen. Now, a days, Windows has been really the subject of a lot of attacks, of viruses, malware, of all kinds of things, and has pulled up its socks. One of the best tools you can use for antivirus and anti-malware is free in the Windows world. And it's called Windows Defender. Now, it's had its problems, and it has its pros as well, free being one of them. But I've seen some really great statistics, and I talk about this in my article on my website here. But um, Windows Defender really is an excellent choice for protecting your computer. If you're a home user, if you don't have a lot of things that you're worried about, it can really do a great job in protecting you. And I've seen some of the numbers, the statistics that have been put out, where they've analyzed some of the major software on the market that's designed, or supposed to anyways, help protect you from the bad guys. And that includes things like the Norton antivirus, right? McAfee, the whole Symantec thing. And when you look at the final numbers, Windows Defender that comes free with Windows, you've got to make sure it's turned on, is something that is as effective or even in some cases more effective than all of those that I mentioned to you. So let's go through a few that I like. For my clients, I use some Cisco anti-malware. It's absolutely phenomenal, but it costs real money. And if you're not a client of mine, you are going to have a hard time getting it because you buy these things in license packs. And some of these license packs or some of the software can be a thousand licenses. So it gets really, really expensive for the little guy. So let's go through the things that aren't expensive. We mentioned free already. It comes with Windows. Next up, Bitdefender. They've got some excellent protection against malware, viruses, and other cyber threats. It's very simple. It has a firewall. Now, you might say, Craig, wait a minute, Windows, doesn't it have a firewall? Yes, it does. And the Windows firewall's biggest problem is that it has pretty much everything turned on and open. If you have a service running, on your Windows computer, whether you know it or not, maybe a file sharing service or maybe a website, that service is open directly to the internet. And it's not really smart about what it's doing. It's a very basic firewall. It doesn't open up all of the packets and try and reassemble them and figure out what's going on, okay? So Bitdefender has a lot of great tools, anti-phishing protection, webcam protection, and as I mentioned, the firewall all built in. I like it. That's the number one thing I would get if you want to pay for something that gives you a little more of an edge. Number two is Malwarebytes. Now, Malwarebytes is primarily a scanner that looks for malicious software, including some rogue security software, adware, spyware, all of which is annoying and can be used to trick you into doing something that you really shouldn't do, like, you know, click on a link that might be bad. Cisco AMP for endpoints is very good, but that cost a few bucks. Cisco Umbrella, excellent, excellent software. But here's the trick with Cisco Umbrella. It has a free version. Check it out online. Cisco um, Umbrella can be purchased for free or for low cost for family by going to OpenDNS.com. 
OpenDNS.com. Check it out. All right, make sure you get my newsletter every week, including all of these tips. CraigPeterson.com slash subscribe. There's a couple more I want to get to right now before we disappear for uh, for a break. But I mentioned Umbrella. I mentioned Cisco AMP for Endpoint, Malwarebytes, Bitdefender. WebRoot antivirus is one that a lot of people I know like. This is kind of a cloud-centric antivirus, anti-malware. It has phishing protection, firewall, ransomware protection. And WebRoot has three consumer versions as well. They've got the basic antivirus package and security plus. F-Secure can help as well. And G-Data antivirus. But uh, I think now you know you can get some of the best protection available for free on your Windows computer by just turning on the Defender. Windows Defender. We're going through some of my tips from recent newsletters and helping you understand a little bit more about your computers and security. Up next, clearing your browser history. We've talked about the top antivirus. You can find that article on my website at craigpeterson.com and anti-malware solutions for total PC protection here, really understanding what you need to do. Let's move on to the next topic here that was in, again, a recent newsletter. And this is more specifically about online privacy. It's probably the number one question I get, which is how can I be safe online? How can I gain a little bit of privacy? And there's a few ways you can do that. I've had a couple articles, and we've talked before about using a privacy-focused a search engine, right? Which means not Google. Uh, there are some out there that you can use. And I've recommended them before. But one of the things you can do is clear your browser history in order to wipe away your online footprint. There are some tools you can use, and I've thought about this for a long time. Uh, you know, what can I release? What should I release? And, you know, part of the problem really is that it can be complicated, and I haven't figured out a way to make it really uncomplicated yet. I guess once I do, I'll, you'll be the first to know. But there are some settings that you can do and you can take. And again, you'll find them on my website. But you need to clear your browser's footprint. Here's the reasons I give the top five for doing this. Number one is privacy. Clearing your browser history, your cache, and your cookies can help to protect your online and protect your privacy because it removes traces of your browsing activity and personal information. There are ways for websites to save information on your computer using these cookies and another method. So by doing this, you can really help to prevent unauthorized access to some of that data and guard against tracking and profiling. Now, profiling is a new technique that's being used, and it's being used because people don't want cookies. So it tries to build a profile of you and uses that to sell your information to people out there that want to get their hands on it. So... Profiling is something you want to avoid. The next reason you want to clear your browser's history is security. Because there are things like session hijacking that are being used more and more nowadays. Now, session hijacking is, let's say you've logged into your bank's, bank's computer via your web browser. And your bank has set up a session cookie. They do this all of the time. There's nothing nefarious about it. They need a cookie to know who you are as you go through their website. Well, sometimes there's some bugs in the software of the bank or the site that you're at. And that 
cookie is used for your session tracking or in some cases in in fact most of them where there's session hijacking there's private information that is encoded in the URL so if you look at your URL at the top of the page you'll see it isn't just you know mybank.com it's mybank.com slash and this big long hexadecimal looking number that number is generically known as a UUID, universally unique ID. And that can be used for your session. Well, a bad guy could potentially use that information, and they have, in order to take over your session with the bank or someone else. So removing these temporary files can really help with these session hijacking it can help with what are called cross-site scripting attacks. These are pretty common out there too. You don't want those. So removing these temporary files as cache data can really help up a lot. It frees up storage space on your computer, but when you actually look at the size of some of these files that are stored, it's, uh, it's hardly worth mentioning. You're going to be removing temporary files that can slow down your browser, cause other issues, and it'll help you prevent unauthorized access. So let's get into exactly how you do this. You'll find it again on my website, craigpeterson.com. Just search for clearing browser history or browser history on my site. So here's what you can do, and I've got some pretty explicit instructions in that page. But in most browsers, you can go into your history tab and click on the clear history or delete history option. It's important to do this. I would advise you do all of these things more or less weekly. If you're using a browser that provides a lot more security than the basics, and that includes a, one of the browsers from Mozilla that will clear everything every time you exit the browser. Um, turn that on too, okay? Clearing your cache again removes those temporary files. Deleting cookies are a good idea. Now remember, if you delete your cookies, your browser is, when it goes back to a website that you've been to before, no one's going to remember that you were there. So it's not going to be able to, uh, you know, drop you right back into the session you were in. So that's the downside of deleting all these older cookies. Also, many people are using their browsers to store their passwords. That's something else I really want to discourage because those passwords that are stored there in the browser are potentially pretty problematic. Because again, if that browser's hacked, if your computer's hacked, the passwords could be accessible to the bad guys. So your bank password that you've stored, you know, you said, yeah, yeah, remember that for me. That password is now available on your computer to bad guys that can gain access to it. Now, the, a lot of us use browser extensions. I certainly do. I have one password, for instance, for keeping all of my passwords and keeping that information straight. And one password has an extension that I have in my browser so it can do an autofill for me, okay? It's pretty darn good. So to disable them, you can go to the extension section of the browser, toggle off all of the extensions you are not actively using. I typically have them disabled. If I need one, I turn it on. That's the safest, safest way to do it. And then the other thing you should consider is the private browsing mode. Many people do use it just generally, and uh, you'll find it in pretty much every browser. Sometimes it's called private browsing. Sometimes it's called incognito mode. But it, what's happening at that point is it's not using your cookies. It's not storing cookies. It's not storing your browsing history. It's not creating those temporary files that last long term. So again, using private browsing mode really will help to mi minimize your browser footprint, something you should do. Now, third-party cookies have been a problem for a long time. 
but most browsers nowadays allow you to turn off what are called cross-site cookies. Maybe I should do a webinar on this and walk you guys through it. L let me know. Just email me, me at craigpeterson.com. Let me know if you think it's a good idea. If enough people ask, I'll, I'll go ahead and put one together, a free little webinar for everybody. But there are a lot of potential problems with these cookies, cross-site cookies, the session hijacking, tracking, profile building, privacy violations. And I've got step-by-step -step instructions in the article for Chrome, Firefox, Safari, and Microsoft Edge. All right, visit me online. Make sure you sign up for my newsletter. Get all of this stuff for free right there. CraigPeterson.com slash subscribe. We're still covering have you had your data stolen, where it was stolen. I'm going to tell you right now a website that you can go to to find out if your personal information has been stolen. And it'll even monitor it for you for free. There's a guy by the name of Troy Hunt. He's down in Australia. And he started a website some years back, and the name's an interesting one. This has to do initially with gamers, online gamers, and then hackers kind of took it over. And it, it's the concept of being owned. You know, I, I own your computer now because I have complete control of it. And then that owned term kind of changed into pwned which is, you know, I stole it from you, basically. Uh, it's now mine. I don't care if it's in your house and you're paying the electric bill. It's mining Bitcoin for me, right? And so he put together a website called HaveIBeenPwned.com. Now, it's not P-O-W-N-E-D. It's P-W-N-E-D. Let's see. Have I been P-O-W-N-E-D. What happens if I go to the wrong URL? Okay, good. It sent you the right one. So it's have I been P-W-N-E-D dot com. Go there. I, if you haven't been there, you have to go there because he has a service that's another part of this whole concept here with having multiple firewalls. It, it's kind of like a submarine. If one one part of the submarine gets damaged, water comes in, you've got hatches in between these other sections and they are not going to get breached, right? You just want the water in one area of a ship or a submarine or the same thing with a firewall. So he has done some amazing yeoman's work. He wasn't paid for any of this for a, the longest time. Now he has a subscription service, and it's being used by 1Password, which is the, my favorite password manager by far. Nobody else even comes close. It's also being used by the browser guys like Google and others. So it's to be trusted. I've never met Troy Hunt myself. I've read a lot of stuff that he's written, and I've seen him speak and things. But this is the website. So it's have, H-A-V-E, I, Bean, B-E-E-N, Pwned, P-W-N-E-D dot com, or you can spell it P-O-W-N-E-D if you'd like. Go there, and you will see there on his homepage a box that you can punch in your email or your phone number. Now, it says international format. So let me make sure you understand what that is. International format, if you're entering a U.S. number, you would say plus one and then the phone number. Okay, our country code is one because, you know, we're the greatest, right? <laughs> well, we were first, the whole phone system in setting up all of the standards. So we are one. So you need to say plus one, your area code, and then your phone number, whatever it might be. And then he will go ahead and look it up in his massive database. So what they've been doing is uh, they have, they being Troy, has been working with companies who had data stolen. And because data had been stolen uh, and these companies wanted to actually kind of be good about it, right, they went ahead and told told uh, Tony, here's here's all of the people's information that was stolen. 
here's what was stolen because you need to know that. Now, I got to tell you, most businesses, if they are hacked, have no clue what was stolen or what the bad guys did. And usually, by the way, the bad guys are living inside your network for a very, very long time. Uh, so he has that, but he also has information that has come from the dark web. And this is one case where I think the government getting involved has been a good thing. The federal government, as they find information about stolen accounts and things online, they've been sending some of that off to Troy. So I think that's fantastic. All here, all trustworthy. So if you put in your phone number here, or if you put in your email address or your password, and we'll talk about that in a second, don't worry about it. You're not giving it to the bad guys. And if you look up in what's called the URL bar up on the top, near the top of your browser, where it has the address of the site that you're on, you'll see a little lock sign and it says the connection is secure. If you click on it, you can look at the certificate and you can see, okay, the certificate is from Cloudflare. They are a company that protects websites. So probably pretty darn legitimate. So I just put in one of my email addresses. This is a throwaway address I've been using for 20, 30 years. And it says, oh no, pwned. All right, so it's telling me that this email address that I've been using for almost 30 years, and it's my own private domain, actually, not almost 30 years, for 30 years, uh, actually 31 now, has been stolen in a data breach. So it's telling me here that it's been pwned in eight data breaches and found in one paste. And let's explain what those are. So the breaches are when bad guys have stolen data. It's been unintentionally exposed to the public. It's been uh, stolen because a bad guy got onto the network, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. It's very, very good. And I notice now that Troy Hunt here on haveibeenpwned.com has a link now to one password password manager which as i said is the only one i use and now it looks like troy, troy is recommending it hopefully he makes a couple of bucks off of that because man has he been doing yeoman's work so it's showing me uh, adobe so 153 million adobe accounts were breached with each containing an internal id username email encrypted password password hint in plain text and more uh, and it says the password cryptology was poorly done. In other words, it was crap. Uh, B2B USA business, 105 million individuals in that breach. Uh, BitTorrent, January 2016, uh, was hacked. BitTorrent is a protocol that I use for downloading copies of large files, particularly Unix executables, ISO images and things, and share them with people. Uh, Clear Voice Surveys. This was in April 2021, and they had a publicly facing database backup that was taken and redistributed on a popular hacking forum. Isn't that something? 15 million unique email addresses, 17 million rows of data, included names, physical and IP addresses, sex, dates of birth, plain text passwords. Oh my gosh. Um, Data enrichment exposure, this was in October 2019, 1.2 billion records, Dropbox, mid-2012, mid and in August 2016, they, uh, they had stolen in 2012, looks like email addresses and passwords, verifications.io, February 2019, right, this just goes on and on, Zynga. So let me see that um, verifications was 763 million unique email addresses, dates of birth, employers, sex, geographic locations, job titles, names, phone numbers, physical addresses, and Zynga. So what I've been seeing, and, and by the way, in the paste, this is the undergroundrevolution.eu paste is what it was called, and it had 34,000 emails in it. So... What does all of this mean? Well, all of this means that I am going to see email that's very convincing. I'm already seeing it. I'm seeing emails, these spam phishing emails that are actually spear phishing in my email boxes that have in them my address, my name, sometimes my phone number, and 
they're trying to convince me of something, right? It's like, okay, um, your account has been compromised. That's just such a common thing for them to say because it has been. Uh, and uh, here's, you know, we need you to do an update. Uh, it's account associated with, and then they give the physical street address or the P.O. box, whatever it might be, so they can steal your information. So that is haveibeenpwned.com. Check it out. Make sure you get my newsletter. It's free. The information's free. craigpeterson.com slash subscribe. And we're going to get into 2FA, 2FA right now. We're going to talk about authenticators right now. Two-factor, multi-factor, what is this? You're hearing it all of the time. Some of us are being required to use it for our businesses, and you're going to see it more and more for good reason. So probably the first industry is to really start using the authenticator idea was banking. It's probably number one. And it was to help secure online banking, financial transactions. And, and then in more recent years, we've seen other industries jumping in, including healthcare, government, technology companies like mine, all using them. Well, why do we use authenticators? You might have seen them. There, some of them are these little key fobs, right, that have a six-digit number that keeps rotating. Some of them are apps. That's what I tend to use on our phones. Uh, the list goes on and on of some of the things that they can do, should do, etc. But the reason you want to use an authenticator like that is because the most secure way of handling your uh, authentication is something you know along with something you have. So the something you know would be your username or your email address and your password, right? That's something you know. But we now know that the bad guys know our usernames and passwords, right? Well, and that's part of the reason I keep saying use a different username or email address and definitely use a different password for every website out there, right? With, without a single exception. You have to do that. And the reason you have to do that is because they've got your current password. They've got your current email address. So what happens with an authenticator is, okay, you know your username and your password. The bad guy knows your username and password. But with an authenticator, they have to have that six-digit code that changes every 30 seconds. They don't have it, right? At least you hope they don't have it. And they don't have it because if you're using an authenticator, like one of those little key fobs, or you're using an application on your phone, some of these applications are free, such as Google Authenticator. And Google Authenticator is a great little authenticator. Google Authenticator works on all kinds of websites right now. Google, of course, uses it. Dropbox, Facebook, Microsoft, most banks, they all use it. So it's free. Why aren't you using it? So what you have to do is you download it onto your smart device. It can be Android. It can be iPhone. And you download Google Authenticator absolutely free. And then what you do is you go to a website that supports Google Authenticator or compatible, right? There's lots of compatible password managers, such as 1Password, which is the one I recommend, and many others that I won't mention because I don't recommend them, okay? Um, but they're all compatible with Google Authenticator. So you go to the website. Usually you'll go into your account settings. And in your account settings where you would change your password, you set up, it's usually called 2FA for 2 factor authentication. What's the first factor? Your username and password. What's your second factor? It is the authenticator. So you set up the authenticator. It might show you a QR code that you scan with your phone. Very easy to do. Uh, I also, if you're using 1Password on your laptop or desktop computer, it shows that, uh, that website will show you 
that uh, QR code and one password will automatically find it on the page and set you all up. It is so easy to do nowadays. So you now have in your Google Authenticator or one password, you now have an account for that specific website, no matter what it is, the bank, Microsoft, Google, whatever. Okay. And so now next time you want to go log in, What's it going to do? Well, be, by the way, it's before you even get to the point of logging in again. It, once you set it up, it's going to say, okay, so tell me what the current six-digit code is just to make sure everything worked right. If you don't give it the right six-digit six code, then, well, that failed and you have to try it again, right? Try to set it up again. It's not going to penalize you because you didn't have the right code, right? You don't lose access to your account. So there's not a lot to worry about here. So next time you go to log in, you are going to be able to pull up Google Authenticator and log in to that account. Now, uh, Google Authenticator, as long as your phone's getting backed up, you're not going to lose those authentications. But there's another trick I want you guys to be aware of. And that is when you set up an authenticator, it will often give you the option of having a bunch of codes, one-time use codes generated. So it'll generate eight or a dozen, maybe more, of these one-time codes. And the idea behind this is keep those codes, don't lose those codes. And if for some reason you're, you lose your authenticator, the phone gets destroyed, your backup didn't work, you can still log in by using one of those one-time passwords. Now, there's a big difference between using an authenticator application that has that six digit code that keeps rotating every 30 seconds with a, a new code. Big difference between that and getting a text message. Text messages can can be and are intercepted. And at the very beginning, I was talking about what? I was talking about getting a text message saying uh, your account has been breached we need to confirm that this is you so that we can clean up the mess and, and uh, please respond with the six digit code that we send you and then the bad guy goes and logs into microsoft google dropbox box facebook your bank whatever it is and what is that company going to do it's going to send you a six digit code because now you're safe right and so that six digit code comes to your phone. And remember, you just got this other text message that said, uh, we're, we're trying to verify the you. You need to send us this code to make sure it's you. And so people now send that six digit code off and the bad guys now have your one time password, your two factor authentication, that six digit number that was texted to you, right? So be very, very careful. It could be done with a something like Google Authenticator or One Password too. They could say, "Oh, we're gonna, well, we need to know your six-digit code," but it's a little more obvious that they're trying to get your uh, two-factor six-digit code from you when it's a, an Authenticator app versus it's just a text message. Then the other thing that's happened before with the text message thing is uh, well, a couple of different things. One. And this is very, very targeted, right? They've got to be coming after you. They know you own a business that has a lot of cash in a bank account that they can steal, or very frequently, you've got a lot of Bitcoin or some other cryptocurrency that they want to get their hands on. So what they'll do is they will either transfer your phone number to their phone, or they will try and clone your SIM. And they do that by calling up your cell phone carrier and pretending they are you. So I want to ask you a question. I want you to think about this seriously. How much information about you is up on the Internet? What do you post on Facebook? What do you post on LinkedIn, Instagram, whatever it is you use online? Can the bad guys go there? and figure out enough about you to fool the phone company into transferring your phone number to them. Man, this happens. I, I know this one guy uh, had a lot of, it was actually Bitcoin, cryptocurrency, and 
uh, he noticed that his phone just I hadn't I'm getting this normal volume of messages or or phone calls so he started looking into it and that's exactly what had happened to him so call your phone carrier right now and say hey uh verizon t-mobile sprint whoever it is you're using um i want to make sure we set up a password so that only i can call and make changes to my account that makes sense to you makes it makes a lot of sense to me so do that do that as soon as the show is over <laughs> Okay, Um, because I got some more information for you here. So that's one of the things they do. And they cannot do that. It it doesn't matter. It's still my phone number all day long. You're not going to have my unique six digit number that changes every 30 seconds. That little key is not going to be in your hands. Now, You should do this, and I have myself done this, on every website that supports it. I did it with my buddy, and it was really kind of fun with him going through because he had a lot of resistance to doing it. And this is even after he had had two paychecks stolen by the bad guys because of how he did things, right, with his passwords and his accounts and everything else, right? Uh, sometimes but anyways uh it, it's not that hard to do now my business as you probably know by now is cybersecurity. it's been my focus in the online world really since i got hacked on the internet back in uh, 91 i guess it was 92 uh, back then it wasn't terribly malicious it was called the morris worm and uh, it, it really hurt my business there for a few days while I tried to figure out what was going on. But uh, I've been doing this for over 30 years. And I have a free newsletter, absolutely free. It is not chock full of advertisements. It's chock full of great information, including my weekly featured tip. And it's something that you should get and you should have. But because my business is cybersecurity, I don't just use two-factor authentication i use multi-factor authentication so i for things that we log in at when we have customer information it's a username it's a password and with us it's also some the one password token kind of like what we were just been talking about here with using a google authenticator compa- authenticator compatible uh device but um I also require biometrics. So it also has to do with face scan in order for us to get at any of our customers information. So read this article. If you didn't get it, if you're not on my list yet, just email me at craigpeterson.com. Let me know what you want. Be glad to send it off or Mary will send it. Take care. Craigpeterson.com online.